Six years in remission is just like positive. Yeah. But six years since an amputation, it's kind of like, oh, you got a divorce six years ago? <laughs> Did you get out of prison six years ago? It's like, yeah, it's kind of good, but it's also like, is it though? <laughs> Have a seat. Thank you, Woody Roseland. <laughs> Come join me. Thank you so much. In this room of my home from 1968. Should we just scream for like five seconds? Oh, I like it. Let's okay. just, let's just, all right, you ready? One, two, two three. three. Ciao, ciao, and welcome back to Creative Chronicles with Jess Bright. Now I'm a little looser. We're in our bodies. Woody, tell us a little bit about what a week in your life looks like. You are very multifaceted, much like the space we're in today. You are bold, creative, dynamic, filmmaker, photographer, artist, director, editor, cancer survivor, husband to a very badass woman that we're going to talk about later. Well, thank you for the intro, Jess. An ideal week, I am in production on some stuff. I'm doing some writing on some things. I'm behind the camera. Uh, I love photography. I feel like photography and film are two sides of the same coin. And so, you know, if I have a video shoot, a photo shoot, I'm able to write, I'm able to tinker with my gear. I feel like that's something that I've realized brings me a lot of joy of just like, I have this like workbench and just like having a piece of gear and some pliers and figuring out how to make everything work together. I've been doing figure drawing, going to figure drawing classes, which is a that's lot of fun. Awesome. Cause they're like two or three hours long. You take an edible wow. before you go in. Nice. And it starts with like one and five minute poses. So it's just like, you're just kind of getting into it. And then it slows down into like 10 and 20 minute poses. So then the edible starts to come <laughs> in. And you, right. and you just like, and you're listening to music. Oh, and, so and it's like two or three hours. You're not looking at your phone. Drawing to me is this very like safe space because I, I call it low stakes creativity you know it's like you do a film project there's like 25 people involved and i think my job is to make everyone feel excited about it and to give everyone their moment you know like there's times where it's like some producer on the project will be like what if we do this and i think my gut instinct is like you need to shut up and go away but it's like no how can we incorporate that idea in so then they feel this pride and ownership in the project which can be difficult and so i feel like drawing is on the exact opposite side of like <laughs> drawing on the exact opposite side of like this is just for me and I don't have to like I don't have to take anyone else's opinions. opinions yeah and also there's moments where it's like I don't know if I want to draw this you know that what's in front of me and you're like well there's no rules here I'm not being graded I can just I can do whatever I want that's been very artistically fulfilling for me and you've been doing your own thing for 10 years taking your own clients running your own business mm -hmm. would you say you've always identified as like a creative or was that something that like when did that come about in you when do you remember that stirring something so like my first big creative moment in my life is I did the school talent show in the fourth grade and I did stand-up comedy and of I, course you did. And I killed, which of course you did. I feel like was actually a curse because then for the next 20 years of my life, I was like, I'm going to be a comedian. <laughs> and now I'm like, I think I love to incorporate comedy into what I do, but I am like mad respect to stand-up comedians. But that is, that's so a difficult, it's a difficult life. It looks so, so hard. Yeah, the lifestyle and like. Very competitive. Read this interesting article by the lead singer of. Arcade Fire. Blink-182. <laughs> the lead singer of Arcade Fire. And he was talking about Spotify. And it was like during some Joe Rogan controversy. And he made the point that Spotify makes it really hard for there to be middle class creative musicians. And I thought that was like a really interesting term of like a middle class creative. And I feel like in the film and photography industry, there is an enormous middle class of people who are making a living from their craft. You know, they're not like famous famous but they like are making a good living yeah like everyone i know who's a filmmaker and photographer is like doing well and so i feel super fortunate yeah. and i think it's because we all just look at our phones all the time and so everyone needs content and so, so do you feel like does social media and like your phone does that fuel the creativity for you in a lot of ways or ideas or i think so i think it's there is a catch-22 where like I wish I didn't spend so much time on my phone. And I feel like I create content that is like shortening people's attention spans, which is bad, but it also is like affording me a comfortable living. Yeah, it's so hard. Like to, when you feel like you're making content that is feeding something you might not in like the larger picture of the yes. world want to be. 
Like one thing I think is so interesting is it used to be uh, like a client video would be like 60 seconds to two minutes, 16 by nine, you know? And now the final deliverable is like a, a 15 second vertical video. Wow, really? That's the majority of your- Yeah, like- oh, like that's shocking. See, I haven't, yeah, so I haven't worked with like corporate clients in a few years. Yeah, like um, that is- So that all the deliverables are like- Mobile. All right, new gear, a little bit of new gear. I got this uh, phone mount for the mirrorless cam. And uh, I don't know about projects you guys are working on, but a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of clients, they're just, they're fine with the phone vid. You know, there's something about the authenticity of the phone vid that they're totally cool with. And the more polished a video is, the more inauthentic it seems. And so, uh, you know, with this rig, you can shoot on something a little bit more slick while still just getting the, that good old, good old iPhone footy. Tomorrow I'm doing photography for at Red Rocks. Oh yeah, well, look at you, corporate brand, you know, like hey, client. Orbiting the hairball. Orbiting, they gotta orbit that hairball. Gotta, yes. Gotta get in, get out, it's, you know? This is, this is true. This is a book you recommended to me back when we were working together. It's a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball, uh, A Corporate Fool's Guide to Surviving with Grace. And it's by this guy who worked at Hallmark, like chief creative officer right, at yeah, Hallmark. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like it's a great book about being a creative in a corporate environment. And the metaphor is that you want to be orbiting the giant hairball because if you get too if you're if you're too low you get you get tangled you get in sucked it up, you get and tangled you, and you can't make anything good you get sucked but, into the chaos you can, yeah it sucks your creative but if you get too weird and you like want to be an individual too much you you fly into, yeah, into you outer space you can't go rogue in a corporate environment and so it's that the the thought of finding finding the balance yeah. of still being in the orbit making things you want to make that serve the greater good and i think that was a that that like a lesson that i still use today of like when when you're getting paid to create for someone else, you're creating for someone else and your own ego and your own ideas have to serve that. And it can't just be the Woody show the whole time. I love that you brought that book so much. It's like such a good fucking lesson. This concept I really love, the trust battery, is that when you start working with someone, you're kind of at 50% and it's like you can either build trust or you can erode trust. And I feel like with Chad and I have a ton of trust in each yeah. other. And so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of fun to be had there. You know, and where really awesome work that comes out of it. Yeah, totally. Chad Neat and I met on Twitter because Tim Tebow was going on his whole playoff run and Chad was singing a song on first take. And so I saw Chad on first take and he was a Denver dude, but at that time he was in LA. But then a couple years later, he moved to Denver. So then we started doing sketch comedy videos together and it really kind of became our sandbox to try out narrative short form comedy and scripted comedy and scripted anything. More recently, we've been doing these corporate commercials together. So we're really grateful that we're getting to this point where clients are trusting us with big budgets to do like really stupid stuff. And we're like, this is this is the dream of totally. like, we did this uh, really fun commercial for Lighthouse Ranch Dressing. <sighs> Where, Big um, fan in our house. <laughs> my wife, uh, Mag, brought home Hidden Valley, and I was like, "This is a lighthouse house. How dare you take Get that it out back. of here?" We did this spot where they built this ranch dressing machine to paint a football oh, field in ranch. And it's like a lot of time and effort and resources went into creating a ranch dressing machine. And we're just like so grateful that they're like, yeah, we're going to put all these resources in because we have this trust for Chad and Woody to like pull off something this awesome. dumb. Oh my gosh. It's been a lot of fun to, to scale up, but, but also crazy to, to have all those people to deliver 15 second mobile formatted stuff. Are you on TikTok? No, I, I like got on there being like, yeah, I should be on here. I was getting some ideas for like our daughter's snacks and shit, but I just don't, I couldn't connect. Okay. It's funny because for I, me, yeah. I had to get rid of it because it was like, it's like weapons grade social media, you know, like their algorithm. You never like have to like or follow anything. It just knows what is in your soul. And it's just <laughs> like, we're going to serve you this. And you're like, is this who I am? 
I've been on threads recently oh, yeah. and it's funny because it has a similar thing where you just kind of scroll but it 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 can tell where you pause and like what you're like oh I'll take a peek at this and it always is like oh you want to see like half naked women and I'm like no I, I honestly am like not trying to see this and it's like yeah but if we just like put it in your feed you're gonna like you're gonna linger on it and so we're gonna give you more and you're like no but like could we not could it just be like I don't know my friends post and like cool like artist time lapses and they're like no boobs I'm like oh they know I'm like they're like is we got another one are you using AI for what are you using AI for? oh I love AI yes. I'm having okay. a good time see and I, I love like I love when you share what you're kind of playing with mm. on AI I don't mm -hmm. remember what the last one was was it nine I, was it nine eleven kitten <laughs> <laughs> my masterpiece. 9-11 Air Bud, also good. Oh my gosh. I've been messing around with like ChatGPT and Midjourney a lot. Yes, yeah, so you, you definitely got me, like you were actually one of the people that I was like, I'm getting into ChatGPT, it's gonna be today. I'm probably on ChatGPT every day. ChatGPT is like, I feel like it just it's, it gets you 80% of the way there. I'll use ChatGPT to like write emails or like soften my emails or like make my emails more fun. I'll, if I have to like deliver a kind of tough email, just, yes. just like copy and paste it and just like rewrite this email in the voice of Matthew McConaughey. Just like, just okay, so we've talked a little bit about comedy, creativity. Let's go back in time a little bit where comedy, motivational speaking took like a forefront in your life. Yeah, totally. So I uh, did stand up when I was a little kid kind of wanted to get back into it. How old were you around that? You know, like 18, 19 okay. in there. And then I was diagnosed with cancer and there were all these kind of organizations that supported me throughout my journey, whether with grants or, you know, helping me find drug trials. And then they would have these fundraisers and they'd be like, hey, we need a patient story can you get up and talk? And it was like, oh, I can just go up and say whatever I want. And they're like, yeah, you have the floor. And it was like, great, I'm gonna make some stupid cancer jokes. When you drink, it's liquor before beer. But when you do chemo, it's methotrexate before leucomorin. <laughs> and so it was like, okay, I can do comedy. And that became kind of a big part of what I did of like motivational speaking that was like some comedy, some motivational speaking, but it was nice cause it was these really easy audiences cause it was like, here's this sad kid with cancer. And then I'd tell a joke and it was like, oh, this isn't, you know, whereas I feel like if you're doing stand up, it's people being like, prove to me that you're funny. And I was always like, oh, I'm not that funny. I you already had like the pity audience. Yes. <laughs> so I did motivational speaking for a long time. That was like my early 20s. Like my main wow. income was. While you were going through treatment? Yeah, because I was on and off treatment for like okay. seven years. Because it showed up in my leg. I had a knee replacement. Then it came to my lungs. I had a bunch of drug trials, chemo, lung surgeries, just kind of on and off for okay. years and years. So and during that whole thing, you're you're speaking at events and yeah i'm kind of in school okay. but like i was never very i never graduated college it wasn't like where i excelled at all what were you in school for i uh, like marketing okay but, all right but i think when i dropped out i was like a second semester sophomore or something so that's like a year and a half you know but i was i was in school for like a long time <laughs> Much longer than <laughs> to be a second semester sophomore. But I also am great because I was going to Metro. Okay. So it was like it was like super cheap, yeah. and so I don't have like student loans. So Do I'm you like, still have like friends from that from there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty uh, unmemorable college. I had fun in college though. I guess, do I? Once I kind of started doing more motivational okay. speaking, I gave the TEDx talk. Cancer affects everybody. Whether it's having it yourself, like I did, or knowing a close friend or family member who has had it, cancer has become an unfortunate fact of life for all of us. In my life, I've had my fair share of cancer. I was initially diagnosed with osteosarcoma in my left knee when I was 16 years old. They quickly did a complete knee replacement surgery, which left me with the same knee that most 65-year-old ex-football players have. After this surgery, I thought I was done with cancer, but my body had different plans in mind. The cancer ended up returning in my lungs. Much to my dismay, this wasn't an isolated incident. It reappeared again and again and again. Four total times I've been told that I would need lung surgery to remove cancer. This was always surprising because I've always responded well to chemotherapy. It finally made sense when they found a four inch tumor lurking in my calf that had been seeding my lungs with tumors this entire time. So we quickly amputated my leg and got me started back on chemotherapy. 
I endured 12 rounds of chemotherapy that I finished just a few short months ago, in case you couldn't tell from my awesome haircut. It was also this really weird balance where I was making all this money to be a motivational speaker, but at the time I'm 21 years old, I'm like mostly dropped out of college, I'm working part-time at a restaurant, I have this like dingy apartment. And that is it, that in Denver? Are you in, in Denver. Okay. And then it's like I go on stage in front of a bunch of people and I like tell them how to live their lives. Right. And then I go home to my like crappy apartment where I like smoke a bunch of weed and I don't know. In between speeches, my life was not inspirational. And bone cancer is a uh, like stubborn form of cancer. Like you think about like skin cancer is skin cells that are cancerous. Bone cancer is bone cells that are cancerous. And so it's just like a hearty cancer that you really have to get after. And so um, chemotherapy is a lot like antibiotics is that once you do one you can't really do it again because if you think you have a hundred percent of cancer cells you do a chemo it kills 98 percent and then they start regrowing from that two percent that survived now you have a new hundred percent is that like those were the ones that were resistant to the chemotherapy so you have to come at it from a different angle so what happens is as time goes on and you try new treatments yeah. they get less and less effective and so that's why it kept coming back is like, we just couldn't quite, you know, turn that corner and eradicate it. And so they had to amputate the leg. It was funny, I found out on a Thursday and they were like, okay, well we can get you tomorrow. We can amputate it tomorrow. Oh. And I was like, oh. let's pump the brakes. I'm still gonna have cancer on Monday. Like, can we, can we do it then? And you're at, how old at that point? Like, like 23, it was so maybe, tw no, it was like 21. Cause I hit 10 years. Oh. A little bit ago. Like, yeah. Oh, wow. T 10 years in remission? 10 years. No, no, no. It's funny the distinction between remission and like sincere amputation because it's like six years in remission is just like positive. Yeah. But six years since an amputation, it's kind of like, oh, you got a divorce six years ago? <laughs> Did you get out of prison six years ago? It's like, yeah, it's, ki it's kind of good, but it's also like... Is it though? It's like a weird thing to celebrate. Not an anniversary that, yeah. You're not like, a, I'm a not card. like thrilled like a, about There's it. no Hallmark card for like happy. <laughs> I heard you're now disabled. And like mentally, what are those years afterwards? Uh, Yeah, definitely a tough couple years for sure. Cause it was like, I got re-diagnosed. I'd have my leg amputated and then I had to start treatment again. So you had to go through treatment after the amputation. Yeah, like like probably the hardest treatment I ever did was after my amputation. Oh. And so I had to like move back in my dad in Aurora. That's just like, all my friends are graduating college and getting I don't know what's so wrong with Aurora, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually like a couple yeah, miles from where did, you guys live. Do you guys live. live close to us? When I was 21 and amputated. Oh, they don't, they don't live out there anymore? No, my dad moved to Florida. Oh, okay. okay. He's a Florida man now. Okay. <laughs> but uh, no, it was it was it was a tough stretch because like I didn't have a car. It takes a long time. You have to wait like a couple months before you can get a prosthetic leg. In the first couple years with a prosthetic leg, it's very difficult. Like I've definitely found a much better quality of life now, but like it takes a while to like. Because your leg, you know, you think about it, you cut it off, your leg swells, it atrophies, it's like constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And so the fit on the prosthetic is like gotcha. very difficult to dial in. Like imagine wearing like a really uncomfortable pair of shoes or like a really uncomfortable right. bra. It's, it's also like this weird like identity thing too of like, imagine like every time you leave the house, you have to like wear a pair of pants that you're like, these, are, these pants are not me. But it's like, nope, you gotta wear the Jinko baggy pants again today. And you're like, I don't I don't wanna be Jinko baggy pants guy today. I don't want people at the airport to like come up and talk to me again today. And it's like, well, it's who you are. So that that's been a whole part of it too, which I feel like I'm at a better place. But at thirty three years old you feel like you've come into like the woody that is all of those things. Yeah, I think so. The more chemo I did, like, the more my hair stopped coming back. And so that was a part of, like, the identity thing, too, of, like, like, I used to have good hair. Like, I can send you a photo. <laughs> Everyone in my family has good hair, oh you God. know? And then just being like, not anymore, you don't. The leg was one thing, but there were other aspects of your identity that, like, went out the fucking window. Yeah. In the entire process. I think also there was this this feeling of, like, really wanting to be traditionally handsome. 
<laughs> and like like seeing myself as like someone who's supposed to be very traditionally handsome and then being like you can just be like weird and unique and i think that's like better than but just they're still handsome it's not one or the other <laughs> that's true I, you know it sounds like you've done work on like redefining like the picture yeah. you know also having the name woody it's like i've all i've always felt like kind of a weirdo i've always been Is that like your full name woodrow, woodrow. yeah and so just being like, you know what? Like, I think there's more fun to be had as just kind of like a deranged maniac. Like embracing it. Than like a handsome, normal person. <laughs> and so let's fucking go. So we're back in like your mid treatment journey and you're yeah. speaking motivationally and you're making a decent yeah. living ish. ish. Yeah, yeah. For that like, age and like not having a degree, you're like making it around. Yeah. And then what happens? Met my former partner. Okay. We started the video production business. It goes well, like we did this video that was very well received and then everyone came to us wanting their version of that video, which it was like voiceover based, poetically inclined, time lapses and B-roll. And so we just did this version of that that video over and over and over again. And it was like, like I feel like with the motivational speaking, I felt like I was kind of in this box of like, you just Woody the Cancer Guy, you know, dance monkey dance. And then I was like, cool, here's this new thing. And it's like, cool, here's this new tiny box to be in. And it was like, ooh, okay. Like, so then I feel like working with Chad and it was like, okay, let's bring the photography in. And so now I, I feel like I'm in a very good place of like, I kind of have these multiple little things I can do. And you don't need your one thing that's gonna be your home run that's gonna like promise you like success and happiness. Yeah. It's just like, that doesn't exist. Just like get your little base hits, keep growing, like have good creative experiences with others and like keep the ball rolling. Yeah. How old are you? I just turned 33. 33. Oh yeah, you just had a birthday. I did. Happy belated. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, magic number. 33. Ooh. I just tried, I turned 35. Yeah, I thought you were a little older than me. It's because I'm bald. <laughs> I'm a BWM. <laughs> a bald white man. <laughs> a bald white man. I was looking up. I I, I, I never this, heard that. I had this notebook, and it was uh, New Year's resolutions, and it was be a good representative of BWMs. You were such a good representative. I of try. BWMs. It's like Stanley Tucci, and then me. I think. I'm not even a big Stanley Tucci fan, to be honest. But as you. far as bald white men go, Stanley Tucci is people like people love him. People he, love him because we got like we got Bezos. We got Ugh. we got like like every <laughs> horrific so right. every horrific man in Congress is like a BWM. The, the, yeah. And so oh, yeah. there's Ugh. yeah, you're such you, oh thank God. Yeah. Do your parts. I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying. You do your parts. So I asked you to bring a couple personal identity props to you today. Can we start with your do you call it your million dollar idea notebook? Or is that that's just how I've like seen it referred to on the gram? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it, so I'd say it's more my notebook system that I'm proud of. So, uh, I have two notebooks at all times. I got my, I got my big one and I got the pocket notebook. And so, like, this is always on me. And then this is just, like, to-do lists and little fragments of ideas. And then this one is, like, meeting notes, journaling, like, writing. And the way I organize it is it's all chronological. And I feel like... Wow that's the secret sauce yeah. is that like i don't have a delineation between work and home and anything it's just like based on time and so that makes it really easy to find stuff of like okay i know this was an idea i had when mac and i were in mexico last year and it's like what date was that and you can find it right away it's number 31 of that little one that you've got yeah so i have, so you have like, an archive at home i have an archive at home okay. this is so stuff doesn't slip through the cracks you know when someone's like oh, like, here's a book I've read that's really good. And you're like, okay, I'm going to remember it. And your brain is like, it's like, put it in here. Okay, what else? I brought so my good. favorite, my favorite camera. So this is a, this is a Fuji X100. And um, this was a gift to me by Mackenzie, my wife. And I feel like it's just the most fun camera I've ever owned. And it's easy to use. It's beautiful. It's not intimidating. Like when I travel, this is usually the only camera I take. There's something new I've been doing where it's called Fuji Recipes. It basically, you can kind of hack the camera so that it takes finished JPEGs that are colored and look oh. beautiful rather than taking a raw image. You have to put it into Lightroom. Then you have to export it from Lightroom. You can take a beautiful JPEG image that you can send to your phone and you can post right away. Cause you think about like the difference in quality between a cell phone image and this is truthfully not a yeah. ton. Right. And so like, how do you justify 
using, using this camera for an extra 7% of quality. How, how much of the photos that we see on your Instagram are from that camera? Probably a decent amount. I mean, best photographer in Denver. <laughs> well, we'll take it. We'll take it. So we do a little sign out? Yeah, let's do a little sign out. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here today, Woody. I really appreciate it. You were literally one of the first people that came to mind when I got this idea to kind of just start sitting down with people that I've admired, people that inspire me, people that have, I think, really important creative like mind frames mm. to share with other people or like your works. I, l I love watching you and Mac online. I, we got to do a double date soon. We're we way, we're so long overdue. My mom lives with us now. We have a lot of help so we can like escape. We'll come to Ooh, you guys. We'll okay. come downtown. Wow. Please like do. we'll do like a fun night or something. We love you. I appreciate you. Thank you. The feeling's mutual. Check him out on Instagram. And a big congrats to you, Woody, for winning the Portugal Indie Film Festival Award of the Year for your new short film noir that was shot entirely in Lisbon. It is so vibey, so cool. Everyone go check it out. The link is down below. Lots of love. Ciao, ciao.